Hi guys, Claudia Bullion here, and today we're going to talk about the 17th of May, 1536. So today we have the executions of George Boleyn and the other gentlemen. Now thankfully the king has commuted their sentence to a simple beheading. They could have been hanged, drawn and quartered, but in his mercy Henry VIII has spared them this. Even Mark Smeaton, who is a commoner and would usually be hanged, drawn and quartered, has been allowed to have a beheading. This may be because, as we know, he's the only one of the men to have pleaded guilty. He might have come to some sort of arrangement with Cromwell in return for him pleading guilty. But we mustn't judge him too harshly for that, because he's very young and as a commoner he would be at much greater risk of torture in his interrogation. So I'm going to give you a summary of the events of the executions as best as I can using sources. So on the morning of the 17th, the five men were brought together in the tower. So that's George, Norris, Brereton, Weston and Smeaton. Now this will have been the first time in a while that any of these men have seen people that are friendly towards them and that are sympathetic to them, because the only people they've seen so far are Kingston and the King's men that have come in to interrogate them. This would have been such a strange and surreal experience because a lot of these men are friends with each other, they've been in the same social group, so there will have been the relief at seeing each other again, and then the sudden realisation that they're all going to be led off to die. So a scaffold has been built on Tower Hill so that as many people as possible can witness these executions. Now Tower Hill is just outside the Tower of London so if you're going to the Tower and want to visit this site it's not actually within the Tower walls, it's just beyond that outside. And that meant that these men were expected to walk to the scaffold. Now often in Tudor executions, especially for people who are accused and found guilty of being traitors, there's a lot of booing and hissing and jeering, things might be thrown, people might spit. And that was a huge risk for these executions because these men have been judged guilty as traitors and they are going to have to walk among the public to reach the scaffold. Now Henry has made sure that this scaffold is going to be high up so that as many people can see this as possible. He wants people on his side. He wants them to see justice being done and he wants them to see his mercy that he has allowed these men who are traitors and have worked against him and committed adultery with the Queen to be beheaded rather than tortured before their deaths. But as I've said before, the mood among the people is starting to change now. It's starting to become common knowledge that these charges, they don't really have much evidence to back them up and that this seems to be a bit of a conspiracy. Now we know that the crowd must have been quite quiet and respectful watching this because we have several accounts of George's scaffold speech. Now in order for this to be recorded by different people so accurately, it would have had to have been so quiet. And this would have been very surreal for the crowds too because this has never happened in England before. This is the Queen's brother and other men found guilty of committing adultery with the Queen being executed. This is making history. So of the five men, George is the first one to die and this is because he is of the highest status and it is considered to be a privilege to go first because you don't have to watch the others die before you. Now in a lot of ways I can see why that would be preferable but also it's going to have to take someone who's extremely brave and courageous to be that first person to walk up to that scaffold, kneel down and put your head on the block. We think about these Tudor beheadings as just being a part of our history but I want to encourage you to think about this on a human level, on a psychological level. Think about how incredibly difficult it must be and how much strength you must have to walk up to that block and know that when you put your head down on it, they are going to murder you. I think the natural reaction for a lot of us initially would be to run away or to fight it. The human instinct is to want to live, so I can't imagine how incredibly difficult it must have been and the strength of will that these men must have had to go down on their knees and lay their heads on that block. Now, some Tudor prisoners did give in to this urge to try and run, unfortunately. Um, the Countess of Salisbury in 1541, she was a maternal, quite motherly figure to Mary I after Catherine of Aragon has died. Now, she is sentenced to be beheaded, but once she gets to the block, it's said that she tries to run away, that she has to be restrained and held down, and because of this, she is hacked up horribly by the executioner. It hardly bears thinking about, it's so horrific. So these men know that they've got to do this properly, they've got to stay still, because they need this to go quickly, they want this to happen in one. Now before George put his head on the block, 
he addressed the crowd, and this was common at Tudor executions. Often the person who was going to be executed would address the crowd with a speech they'd prepared. So it's said that he took a few moments to compose himself. We know that George was a great speaker, and this will have been an important moment for him. Two eyewitness accounts say that he repeats these words. I was born under the law, and I die under the law for as much as it is the law which has condemned me. And then George begins his speech. Now what I have for us today is a reading of this speech by my own brother, Dan James, who is an actor. I thought it would be a good idea to do it this way rather than me just reading it to you, because the point of this series is that I want you to view Anne and George as real people. I thought that Dan being an actor would be able to really get that across to you and really give life to the words and give life to the tragedy of it. So I'm gonna play that to you now. Christian men, I am born under the law and judged under the law and die under the law and the law has condemned me. Masters all, I am not come hither for to preach but for to die. For I have deserved to die if I had twenty lives more shamefully than can be devised. For I am a wretched sinner. And I have sinned shamefully. I have known no man so evil. And to rehearse my sins openly, it were no pleasure to you to hear them, nor yet for me to rehearse them. For God knoweth all. Masters all, I pray you take heed by me and especially my lords and gentlemen of the court, the which I have been among, take heed by me, and beware of such a fall. And I pray to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three persons and one God, that my death may be an example unto you all. And beware, trust not in the vanity of the world, and especially in the flattering of the court, and I cry, God, mercy, and ask all the world forgiveness of God. And if I have offended any man that is not here now, either in thought, word, or deed, and if ye hear any such, I pray you heartily in my behalf, pray them to forgive me for God's sake. And yet, my master's all. I have one thing for to say to you. Men do common and say that I have been a setter forth of the word of God and one that hath favoured the gospel of Christ and because I would not that God's word should be slandered by me. I say unto you all, that if I had followed God's word indeed as I did read it and set it forth to my power, I had not come to this. If I had, I had been a living man among you. Therefore, I pray you, masters all, for God's sake, stick to the truth and follow it, for one good follower is worth three readers, as God knoweth. What I especially like about that reading from Dan, him being an actor, is that it really brings to life George's internal life because we don't know how he delivered his speech. Presumably it was with dignity. He was quite admired for the way that he delivered this speech. He seemed to have done it in a respectable way and people were impressed by the way that he was able to find composure in this terrible moment of his life. I think that in Dan's interpretation of the words and in what he's given it is really a sense of a young man who is facing tragedy and the anger at it and the injustice, perhaps these emotions 
feelings that George wasn't able to openly show, but would certainly have been feeling. So now I'm going to go through that speech with you and explain it a little bit. So George begins, Christian men, I am born under the law and judged under the law and die under the law and the law has condemned me. So here George is saying that the law has found him guilty. This is very different from him saying that he actually is guilty of the charges. And this is a subtle way that George is telling people of his innocence. He says, masters all, I am not come hither for to preach, but for to die. For I have deserved to die if I had twenty lives more shamefully than can be devised. For I am a wretched sinner and I have sinned shamefully. So some modern people have interpreted this as George accepting and admitting to his guilt. But that interpretation doesn't take into account the context of the time that George lived in and his religious beliefs. So first of all, it was considered right and proper that people who had been found guilty by the law would accept their deaths. This was just considered to be polite. And then we have the idea of original sin. I've spoken to you about that before. And that is something that is intensely important to a reformer like George, and it would be the same for Anne. So that's the idea that ever since the fall of man, that's when in the Bible Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden for being disobedient. People have been tainted by this disobedience and therefore every man since Adam and Eve is a sinner and needs to apologise to God. So George has already established to us quite clearly that he is innocent. He swore on the sacrament, remember? So he is staking his immortal soul on this. He is that determined that people know of his innocence. So the sins George would be referring to here would be more private and personal ones between him and God. He goes on to say, I have known no man so evil, and to rehearse my sins openly, it were no pleasure to you to hear them, nor yet for me to rehearse them, for God knoweth all. So George believes that he is about to meet with his God. As a Christian, he wants to do that with a clear conscience. Now he says that God already knows his sins because God knows all, so he doesn't need to name them to the audience. But he admits that he has sinned and he acknowledges these sins. So what are the sins that George is acknowledging? So Claire Cherry and Claire Ridgway, who wrote that brilliant book about George, give us an idea of some of George's more negative qualities and what he might be talking about when he speaks about his sins. Of course we can't know for sure because I think all of us, when we get to the point before our deaths and we look back on our lives, will have a lot of regrets and things that we wish we'd done differently. One of George's more negative qualities is that he was proud and he could be quite arrogant. This is because he's a man of high status. Remember, George is intensely intelligent. He's very charismatic. He definitely would have struggled with humility especially when it came to debates. David Starkey, the historian, writes that George had many of Anne's talents and all of her pride. And Thomas Wyatt, who is George's friend and a fellow poet, at this point, he is still being held in the Tower of London, by the way. He's going to escape death because his family are friends with Cromwell. But he writes in a poem after these events about George. Some say, Rochford haddest thou not been so proud, for thou great wit each man would thee bemoan. Since it is so, many cry aloud, it is a great loss that thou art dead and gone. So in this he is talking about George's pride and his confidence and his great wit, which in the Tudor sense doesn't just mean witty in terms of funny like we would think of it today, it means intelligence. So George is proud, he's intelligent, he's confident, he's a natural speaker and performer. George is certainly not somebody that can be described as shy or humble. And at the time of George's death, remember, we think he was about 32 years old and he's been part of the court since a young age. So he's risen high because of his talents and this is not just because of his association with Anne, it is on his own merits. So George is extremely talented, but also he definitely knows that. We also have Eustace Chapuis writing about George, and he complained that Lord Rochford insisted on entering into religious debate whenever he was being entertained by him. So we know that George never shuts up about reform and Lutheranism, and he talks about it at any opportunity he can. Now another sin or flaw that George might have had is that he could have been promiscuous. We know that he was considered to be very handsome for the time, and that he was popular with women. Now, he might not have been faithful to his wife, Jane, and this could be what he's referring to. But again, this is not uncommon for the time and for his position, especially because him and Jane, with their jobs and their positions in the court, they wouldn't really have spent much time together. Now, there is one comment made by a man called George Cavendish, who is Cardinal Wolsey's man, so he's a Catholic, he's anti the Boleyns, and this is something that I really wanted to squash because we have a, a poem by him 
that describes George Boleyn as an insatiable womanizer and even implies that he was a rapist. Now Claire Ridgway, who is a primary researcher of George, writes, there was no other person who commented on George's womanizing during his life or after his death and no scandal ever surrounded his marriage to Jane. So in Cavendish's poem, he's trying to present George as lecherous and with these huge and terrible sexual appetites going after all women that he can. But remember, this is an enemy of the Boleyns who is trying to monster George. We see the same happening to Anne later, where she is monstered, her reputation is destroyed. He is the only one who says this. And remember that Cromwell was trying to build a case against George. He was so desperate to find something against him that he even used the fact that Anne and George had been alone in a room together to imply that they had committed incest. That is how desperately they're trying to find things on George. If George was this person that only Cavendish implies that he was, then surely Cromwell would have used this against him. Nobody else, not any of his enemies, of which there were many, as you know, even brought this up. So this would seem to be a little bit of propaganda and smearing by George Cavendish. Someone recently brought that up to me in the comments, and what I would say is that when we're looking at historical sources, we have to be very aware of who wrote the sources, are they primary sources? We have to look at the context of these things, because if we took all of these uh, sources on face value, we would be believing a lot of propaganda, a lot of lies, a lot of rumour. As you know, today we still have the rumours that Anne was a witch and Anne had six fingers. For example, if someone from the future was to be researching Barack Obama, for example, you would have to be very aware, <laughs> if you were using as your source Donald Trump, for instance, that you are using the source of somebody who dislikes him, someone who is an enemy. You wouldn't take that necessarily at face value. You would have to investigate those claims. And another sin that George may feel he's committed is that the Berlins are wealthy people, and as a Christian, he will recognise that that is a sin. Um, Anne actually did quite a lot for charity. She was known to do a lot of charitable works, but of course they could have done more. And the Tudor court is notoriously dangerous and corrupt. And as George grew up in this court, he will have been a part of this. He will have been present for lots of terrible goings on. And there will have been times when he didn't speak up against the king and his conscience will tell him, Maybe he should have. So remember he sat on the jury that sentenced Thomas More to death. Now when lots of Catholics refused to accept Henry as head of the church and refused to accept his supremacy, um, a lot of them were put to death. Now, one horrible example of this was the example of the Carthusian monks. So they were executed for their beliefs, and we know that George would have been present then because he was a member of the court. He, like everyone else, will have been silent while that was happening, and I'm sure that will be playing on his mind now. He goes on to say, Therefore, masters all, I pray you take heed by me, and especially my lords and gentlemen of the court, the which I have been among. Take heed by me, and beware of such a fool. And I pray to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three persons and one God, that my death may be an example unto you all. And beware, trust not in the vanity of the world, and especially in the flattering of the court. And I cry God mercy, and ask all the world forgiveness of God. And if I have offended any man that is not here now, either in thought, word, or deed, and if ye hear any such, I pray you heartily in my behalf. Pray them to forgive me for God's sake. So here George is showing his strong religious convictions in what are the final moments of his life. He also speaks quite poignantly of his fall because George did rise very high at a young age and when the king married Anne, of course the Boleyns hit an almost stratospheric level. He is now falling very fast. This has been a very sudden fall. He says, if I have offended any man that is not here now, and this is important because he's apologising to any man that he might have wronged in his life, but more importantly, he's not directly apologising to the king. So this is another subtle way of George saying, look, I'm not guilty of these charges. Yes, I've sinned in my life against people, but not the king and not for this. He says, and yet, my masters all, I have one thing for to say to you. Men do common and say that I have been a setter forth of the word of God, and one that have favoured the gospel of Christ. And because I would not that God's word should be slandered by me, I say unto you all, that if I had followed God's word indeed, as I did read it and set it forth to my power, I had not come to this. If I had, I had been a living man among you. Therefore I pray you, masters all, for God's sake stick to the truth and follow it. For one good follower is worth three readers. 
as God knoweth. So he talks about being a setter forth of the word of God and he's talking about his religious convictions and him being a reformer and how he has played a part along with Anne in trying to make the country more reformist. This also could refer to George's translations. So we know that George made two translations of religious texts for Anne as a gift, but we think that because of this he probably wrote more and they've been destroyed after his death. So he is acknowledging that he has been a promoter of reform. He has set forth the word of God to the best of his ability. He owns that. When he says one good follower is worth three readers, I think that's an incredibly relatable thing for him to say. So he's questioning himself at the end of this and I think that's something that we can understand whether we are religious or not. Perhaps if you're religious that will feel more relevant to you, but I think even to those of us that aren't religious but have um, moral principles and political ideals, I think that when you come to the end of your life you think about those ideals and you think about the ways in which you haven't always met them and you regret those things. You know, we all have our political ideas. I certainly do, quite strongly. But there are times when um, I have acted in ways which go against those ideas and I'm ashamed of those times. And I think we, we all have those things. That's a very relatable sort of thing to say. So when George's speech was over, he knelt down very calmly and he put his head on the block. And thank goodness he was beheaded with a single stroke, so he wouldn't have felt any pain, it was very quick. Then his head was raised to the crowd, which is unpleasant, but that's what happened at Tudor executions. Then his body and his head would have been moved aside, and the next man would have had to take his turn, and that next man was Henry Norris. So Henry Norris will have had the horrible situation of having to witness that and know that he's got to go next. So there will be blood everywhere, the block will be stained with blood, they, they don't clear that away. So Henry Norris will have had to step into that and kneel down in that same spot. Now it's reported that Henry Norris barely said anything, which is quite unusual, and quite a lot of people have attributed that probably to shock at what he's just seen. Now later on in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, that's Anne's daughter, remember, um, Sir Robert Norton tells us that Elizabeth I always honoured the memory of Henry Norris, and she said that he died in a noble cause and in the justification of her mother's innocence. So I know it's not much, but it's good that the future Queen of England will essentially acknowledge that he was a good man and is proud of him and pleased with him for not turning against her mother, even though that could have made life easier for him. Next, it's Francis Weston, and he says, I thought to have lived in abomination, yet thus twenty or thirty years, and then to have made amends. I had thought little it would come to this. So what he's saying is that he thought he would have the chance to grow old and become a better person, that his youthful mistakes would be just that, they would be his youthful mistakes and he would grow from them. Now he doesn't have that chance. William Brereton comes next and he says, I have deserved to die if it were a thousand deaths, but the cause whereof I die judge not, but if ye judge, judge the best. So he's agreeing, like George, that he's a sinner because all men are deserving of death and are inherently sinners. But he's also hinting here that he is not guilty of the sin that he is accused of, but the cause whereof I die judge not. Then last of all, it's Mark Smeaton's turn. So poor Mark Smeaton is last because he is a commoner, he's the youngest there, he's had to watch these brutal executions, he's seen the bodies taken away, there's blood everywhere, and poor Mark Smeaton actually stumbles as he makes his way to the block. So Smeaton's little speech he makes is, Masters, I pray you all pray for me, for I have deserved the death. He's saying he deserved the death, possibly because he's the only one that's pleaded guilty. We think that's almost certainly a lie, that he was manipulated by Cromwell, perhaps promised that he would get a quick death if he said that, rather than being hanged, drawn and quartered. So Lancelot de Carles, when describing these executions, he says that the other four men, other than George, didn't say very much, as if they had commissioned Rochford to speak for them. We know that George was a good speaker, he was a good performer, he was articulate. It seems that he had said all that needed to be said, and the others felt that maybe there wasn't anything they wanted to add to that. Now, as for Anne, she is still in the tower, and she is waiting for Kingston to give her news about her own execution. 
and news about George and the other men. So contrary to popular belief, Anne did not witness these executions she couldn't have from where she was stationed in the tower. It's thought that Thomas Wyatt, who was still in the tower at the time, did witness the executions because he was situated in the right place. He would have been able to see Tower Hill. But Anne certainly wouldn't have, so she'd be aware of the sound of the scaffold being made. She would probably have heard the crowds. She might have heard the gasping as people were beheaded. She would have known it was going on, but she wouldn't have seen it. And I can't imagine how absolutely torturous that must be to think about your brother going out to face his death knowing that's going on but there's nothing that you can do about it you can't see him you can't give him any words of comfort so kingston comes in to see anne and he informs her that the date of her death is going to be tomorrow the 18th he also tells her that the king has decided in his mercy that she is going to be beheaded by French sword uh, instead of being burned at the stake. He tells Anne about the French swordsman that's coming from Calais and he actually tries to comfort her a little bit and he tells her not to worry because the blow will be so subtle. So Joanna Denny writes about how dignified Anne was and how this surprised Kingston. Remember that yesterday Anne was in hope of life. She'd become more hopeful because she'd spoken to Cranmer. She had agreed that her marriage was invalid so there's still a chance that she'd be spared. But she accepts this very calmly i think perhaps because george is dead now her friends are dead now she accepts that this is real and i'm sure she would want to see george again so anne asks kingston to please tell her about the execution of george and of the other men because obviously she wasn't there herself and kingston does as he's told he tells her all about it joanna denny tells us that anne suffered greatly to hear about george's execution and about his bravery on the scaffold now anne even feels pity for mark smeaton here obviously we would feel pity for him now because he's a young man caught in this terrible situation Situation. But for Anne, he is the one man that is working with Cromwell, he has been manipulated by Cromwell into saying that he's guilty, and that's partly why she's been found guilty and why this is happening. But she's actually concerned about him, because Anne's view of the world, because of her religion, is that good innocent people, people who repent to God, will end up being with God in the next life. So although she's devastated about George, she it, she's confident that he will now be with God. She's so scared for Mark's meeting because she's worried that this lie that he's told will compromise his immortal soul and he won't get to meet God, he won't go to heaven. She's extremely worried about that. According to a later account, Anne actually says, Alas, has he not then cleared me of the public shame he has brought me to? Alas, I fear his soul suffers for his false accusations. And what I'm going to leave you with today is Anne's thoughts about what's happening in the next life. And they're kind of more hopeful, even though this is a terrible situation. She says, But for my brother and those others, I doubt not that they are now in the presence of that great king before whom I am to be tomorrow. So Anne is taking comfort in the fact that George is now with God and that tomorrow she will be with him. They will be there together in peace and they will be with their God, which, as their religion is so important to them, that would seem to them like a paradise. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm actually going to put in the description box the links to uh, Dan's social media, etc. He's portrayed George for me before in a song I wrote about George, uh, which I will put here if I can figure out how to. Um, so yeah, follow him if you can. I often think of Dan as my own George because he's witty, charismatic, good speaker, talented, intelligent, all those good qualities. Um, so yeah, I'll put those there for you and I will see you tomorrow for another instalment of these videos. Okay, I love you loads and I will see you really soon. Bye!